Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. Good evening, guys, or good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior with your host, Lawrence Neal. This podcast is founded by an urge to answer a limitless number of questions I seem to have. I exercise an obsessive curiosity to understand the specifics and the details on how to optimize productivity in health, career, business, and lifestyle. My guests include the biggest names in health and fitness, all the way through to very knowledgeable underground high-intensity training experts, personal trainers, New York Times best-selling authors, highly successful business owners, through to startup entrepreneurs, life hackers, finance gurus, and many more. My next guests are James Fisher and Luke Carson, who both joined me for a third time each, but this time we did a roundtable session. James is a senior lecturer at Southampton Sony University, an academic researcher and reviewer in strength and conditioning, applied physiology, nutrition and metabolism, etc. Luke is the founder and CEO of Discover Strength, based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Discover Strength's personal training facilities are among the highest volume revenue training facilities in the world. Luke speaks around the world on the topics of evidence-based exercise and the fundamentals of building successful businesses. This was a really fun dynamic that I really, really enjoyed. We kick off with some very useful business success principles and tips from Luke. Then James updates us on the latest research and findings in exercise. And then the three of us geek out on exercise and particularly high-intensity strength training. We answer your questions, we talk about how to optimize hypertrophy, what is the best time to train, what are everyone's thoughts on accentuating the negative in training, our training routines, and then we switch gears to talk about nutrition, and in particular a zero-carb diet, and much, much more. So without further ado, please enjoy this Geek Out session with Luke, James, and myself. James, Luke, welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior. Thanks for joining me this evening, or I think it's actually probably lunchtime for you, Luke. Is it something like that? It is, it is. Thanks Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure to be here with you, Lawrence. Absolutely. Well. Thank you. So I wanted to kick off with um, some questions around business. Um, you, uh, Luke, you'll be hosting the upcoming Resistance Exercise Conference soon. Um, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about that. What's what's you know what's going to be happening on the day? What speakers do you have? Um, you mentioned there's a roundtable, and and I'd just like to understand a little bit more about the event. Yeah, of course. So we're, we're excited about it. So this is the seventh year of the conference, and for the first time. We're doing it at a new venue. We're doing it at the JW Marriott. It's April 7th and 8th. And we have a unique format in that we really bring together kind of the, the godfathers, if you will, of high-intensity training. And that we're doing a roundtable with Dr. Ellington Darden, Jim Flanagan, who was really the true right-hand man of, of Arthur Jones for close to 25 years or over 25 years, Roger Schwab who uh, most of your listeners know Roger's name. He owned and operated Mainline Health and Fitness in the Pennsylvania area in the U.S. for just about 30 years. And now he has since sold his interest in that and is working on some X-Force projects. But he was also the head judge for the IFBB for a number of years. And then lastly, Kim Wood. So Kim Wood was the first real full-time strength and conditioning coach in the NFL with the Cincinnati Bengals. And he was also the co-founder of Hammer Strength. And he uh, owned Nautilus Midwest distributorship and sold the majority of for a long period of time, as long as Arthur owned the company, sold more Nautilus machines than, than anybody. So those four guys together are the guys that were closest to the founding of Nautilus and what we now call high intensity training and were the, really the closest to Arthur Jones. So we have that roundtable. In addition to that roundtable, each one of those individuals is going to do a 30-minute a special topics presentation. So we'll get to hear them on their own. And then we have three keynote presentations that we're excited about. So James Fisher is going to give a keynote, and I'll let him talk a little bit about his topic. The topic that he has is absolutely fascinating and has an incredible 
correlation or will pull together that roundtable with the more current evidence around strength training for hypertrophy and strength, etc. So James is one of our keynotes. The other keynote that we're thrilled about is Stuart Phillips, who's at McMaster University in Canada. And he's a guy that really almost needs no introduction. He has a, a, a tremendous talk prepared also that I called James right away and told him how excited I was when I found out what, what Stu's topic is going to be and some of the things that he's going to discuss. It should be phenomenal. And then lastly, we have Taylor Melvin, who's a long, long, long time personal trainer in our organization at Discover Strength. And she's going to do a little bit more of the, the if there's an art and science of, of exercise prescription and of strength training, she's going to be a little bit more on the art side. And she's working through that presentation now, but it's going to be something along the lines of challenging the process and looking at the, the assumptions that all personal trainers and strength training practitioners make and try to maybe uh, challenge those assumptions. So we're excited. It's the first time we're going to two full days, Lawrence. So we're going all day Friday, all day Saturday. We have roundtables and keynotes and breakouts, and we do, we're do we doing a big uh, attendee social Friday night, the first night, and we're doing a workout for all the attendees where they get trained. So we, we couldn't be more excited. It's my favorite two days of the year. James, can you elaborate on what you'll be talking about? At the uh, I mean, I know I know Luke kind of prefaced it, but um, or, or are you going to keep it a secret? <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm I'm going to share because I think it might be it might uh, be quite interesting for a few people. So I'm going to look at some of um, Arthur Jones's principles actually, um, and I'm going to kind of look at whether. Um, you know, the evidence, uh, the scientific peer-reviewed evidence, um, you know, of recent years, sort of over even the last uh, 10 years or so really kind of supports or, or, or how it works in, in relation to those principles from from the 1970s. Um, you know, it, it's 10 years since Arthur's death in 2007, or nearly 10 years. And, um, and you know, I think that we... Uh, as an exercise science community sometimes get so caught up on our own research and ideas that we lose that people have already talked about this or, or already hypothesized about this, you know, nearly 50 years ago. Uh, and really, we should have been paying attention, um, you know, back then. And we could have we could have moved a lot further forward if we just listened or learned. So, um, yeah, and, and that's not to say that everything I'm going to say is going to support Arthur uh, or what Arthur said. But, yeah, I'm going to kind of reflect on some of, some of his maybe lesser known principles so but just to uh, echo what luke said and this is not meant to sound like an advert for the resistance exercise conference but i've been speaking there for five years now and it's absolutely the best exercise science conference i've ever been to um you know i've been to them across the world dresden uh, germany brazil uh vienna european college of sports sciences um in vienna this year and um i can remember the first year i went 2013 when it was called the hit resurgence and i met Legends like Mark Asanovich and Brian Johnston, um, Matt Brisky spoke then, and but it's a great chance to to meet the the trainers as well that run these facilities. Um, uh, Diane Del Garbino, uh, Dwayne Wimmer, uh, the legend that is Dave Durrell and, and Patty Durrell running rock solid down in Florida. So for me as a scientist, it's great to speak to the the practitioners in industry and talk to them about how what I do impacts what they do and, and vice versa you know hear hear their thoughts on what we should be doing so yeah it's just a it's just an incredible opportunity really so uh luke what's the date again it's april 7th and april 8th so that's a friday and saturday and i think people are interested in this it's at the jw marriott which is a brand new hotel it's a beautiful hotel and that's connected to the Mall of America, which is, for the longest time, was the largest mall in the world. Now, I think a couple malls have surpassed it, but it's really, believe it or not, a massive tourist destination. So if someone's traveling from out of town, it's a great weekend to check out this, this massive mall and spend two days talking about strength training and, and spending time with colleagues. Good stuff. No, I'd uh, I'd love to come myself, um, and I'm even sitting here or standing here, I should say, thinking about how I could make that possibly happen. Uh, <laughs> how do people actually sort of go about purchasing tickets and that type of thing? 
Yeah, yeah, good question. They they just go to resistanceexerciseconference.com and all the information, bios on the speakers and and where to register, how to register. They can just register online and make hotel reservations, whatever they need to do. They can do it right there at that site. And then I, I would just throw this out there for your listenership. For people that are really working in health clubs and gyms and studios and so forth, we open our doors. If someone is coming to town, come in a little bit early and spend some time at one of our locations, uh, any of our Discover Strength locations, and spend some time with our staff and watch workouts and maybe go through a workout and do whatever you want to do to make your whole visit worthwhile because sometimes it's fun to – to couple going to a great conference, couple that with visiting some facilities as well. So we, we definitely welcome any attendees to do that. You also mentioned you're doing a two-day course with Jim Flanagan. Is that separate to the conference, I assume? Yeah, so the idea there, that's that's an interesting question, Lawrence. The idea there was over the last seven years of this conference, we've straddled just a little bit into maybe 5 or 10% of the conference talking about some of the business and management principles that will help grow the personal training studio, the health club, personal training department, just grow the business in general and become better leaders and managers and so forth. So what we've decided to do now is to not really include that in this year's conference. So this year's conference will really be the first conference that doesn't include anything about growing your business. We're going to try to keep it really strict to just exercise. But we, of course, have a tremendous passion for growing your business and, and becoming a more successful operator, manager, leader, etc. And so the way that we are we are focusing on that market is we're just doing a separate course. So I do the course along with Jim Flanagan and we just do it four times out of the year. It's a two day course. It's a real deep dive into how to run your, your studio. And so we just did one in, uh, in Orlando two weeks ago, and we'll have another one coming up in June. So that's a, a different deal. That's called the real hit experience is the the name of it and you spend a day with jim flanagan and you talk about the history of high intensity training and arthur jones and spend time in jim's private training facility which james can attest to this is it has to be the most impressive home gym in the whole world um it is absolutely like a museum of nautilus and medics and arthur jones it's just remarkable and then we spend a full day the next day diving into the entire business side of the equation so that's a deal that's much smaller in scale but it's for that studio operator really really wants to take their business to the next level in terms of revenue and profits and growth and just wants to scale the business in general cool that's a neat segue actually i just wanted to ask you um a couple business questions that are particularly um pertinent to me but also one which i've been asked from listeners um in terms of marketing, Luke, so what, what's worked best for you in terms of marketing, Discover Strength, and what have been the, the most powerful marketing tactics that you've employed and continue to use? So, Lawrence, that question is a question that we hear all the time, but it, the answer is it never starts with tactics. It starts with understanding your differentiation. Because if you start with tactics, then you don't really understand you don't have a clear vision on what are we communicating, what are we storytelling around when we're marketing. And marketing is just storytelling. So you're storytelling on the platform that your target market consumes. So that might be Facebook. That might 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 be direct mail. That might be Instagram. It might be Snapchat. Um, but wherever your target market is spending their time, that's where we want to do the storytelling. But the important part is... What are we telling stories around? And until you understand what your differentiation is, you can't do that effectively. So what we, we encourage companies to do is to understand on paper what are the three things that make our business unique, just three. and We, we call it three uniques. But those three things really are your strategic anchors for understanding what makes us different than the rest of the competitors out there. We can't compete by being better. We have to compete by being different. And when I ask different gym operators and health club operators, what makes you different, their first five answers have nothing to do with what actually makes them different. It's always 
what makes them better. They say, oh, we have a better staff. Well, we have a great staff. And I say, well, everyone says they have a great staff. Oh, we have great programs. Everyone says they have great programs. We have great equipment. Everyone says you have great equipment. What actually on paper makes you different? Once you've identified those three things, Lawrence, your actual differentiators, on paper, your competitors would agree with you that that, in fact, makes you different. Then you communicate and you storytell only around those three things. So if you look at 95% of the social media content that we put out there, the print marketing that we have, our internal marketing campaigns within our facilities, we are going to speak only to the uniques of our business. And otherwise, we're just basically standing up and saying, hey, we're a fitness facility. Come do fitness with us. And we don't want to do that. We want to make sure we're communicating just around what's unique to us. So to answer your question more succinctly, I would just say, the operator has to understand what makes them different and then start telling stories around those differences and only those differences. What are the things that are unique about Discover Strength? What are those three? Yeah, so number one is what we call, and by the way, none of these are supposed to sound sexy. They just give us great clarity and great focus. So one of them is strength training. So that's a unique. Every competitor around us will do any type of personal training with you. They'll do a little bit of cardio, a little bit of stretching, a little bit of strength training, a little bit of boot camp style. A little, I mean, you name it, they will do it. Strength training for us is the only thing we do. We're not going to talk about nutrition. We're not going to do any stretching. We're not going to do – we are just going to do strength training. So that's number one. Number two is what we call expert educated instructors. So that doesn't say that our trainers are better than anybody else's. It just says that they are educated, expert instructors, meaning they're going to have a minimum of a four-year degree in exercise science. They're going to, at a minimum, be American College of Sports Medicine certified exercise physiologists, and they're going to go through a tremendous amount of internal training, books that they read, quizzes that they take, different uh, modules that they'll go through internally. So that really makes us different in that our trainer is not someone who's just passionate about fitness, but they actually have the training, the education, and the credentials that support that. And then the last one is efficient. So that's one of our differentiators. Our workouts are 30 minutes. We want to see a client one to two times per week, and that's it. So on paper, those three things make us different than the rest of our competitive landscape. Now, let me tell you, if every other training studio, every other high-intensity training studio moved into our market, the strength training part wouldn't be unique anymore, and the efficient part would not be unique anymore, and maybe we could hang on to the expert educated instructor because we are really pushing the education of our instructors. So we really only have one of those things. And you can hang on to one, but we may have to craft or change those three uniques so that, again, relative to the competitors in our market, are we maintaining that differentiation and communicating around that differentiation? Now, it's really interesting hearing examples specific to your business because I think it, it paints a picture for people listening. Um, I would also be interested in what is your actual, do you have like a, a specific avatar as your demographic that you market to? And can you elaborate on what that is? Yeah, of course. So that's the second part of really understanding the marketing is what your avatar look like. And so for us, it's Mary and Michael. Everything that we create from a content standpoint is only for Mary and Michael. So Mary is 42 years old. She's an attorney. She makes $220,000 US dollars in income. She looks good, but she always wants to lose 10 pounds. She takes spin classes. She drinks wine. She enjoys a getaway to, to South Beach in Miami. She always has a fresh pedicure and manicure. She shops at a store called Lululemon and she stop, shops at Nordstrom. She's involved in charity and philanthropy. She loves a challenge and she likes her whole life. Can I just say that? She, can I just jump in there? She sounds absolutely tremendous. Can you introduce me to Mary when I come? <laughs> Uh, you're not you're not the first person to say that. And so Michael's, you know, our male, he's a little bit older. He's 56 years old. He's an executive. He actually makes less money than Mary. He makes $175,000 a year. He's a wine and a whiskey drinker, a golfer. He has getaways to Colorado to go skiing, a couple of adult children. He's got a full schedule, values his time. He's type A. He wears a sport coat and he always has great shoes on, but he's not a guy that wears a tie or a suit. 
I can't believe the level of specificity you've just shown. Please tell me you have that open on a text file. You didn't do that off the top of your head. So I, I, I could have given you 80% of that off the top of my head. When I got into my description of Mary, I had to pull up the document that I have in front of me, and I, I, I went through some of it off the document. So I was, I was cheating for sure. But our, our litmus test is, hey, we work with 18-year-old clients and 22-year-old clients and nine-year-old clients and 85-year-old clients, but we will never market to them. We are only marketing to Mary and Michael. That's truly our sweet spot. And the more that we message just to Mary and Michael, the more Mary and Michaels we're going to get. And of course, we're going to continue to get people on other either end of Mary and Michael, but that's our focus. That's pretty uh, specific. You could advertise on eHarmony, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should do that. Maybe that's... Uh, 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 James, I'm going to let you run that by Hannah. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> so um, a number of the number of people that listen to this podcast are... Um, they've either just started high-intensity training businesses, thinking about you, Skylar, um, or they've been running them for a while, but they're they're keen to figure out how they can scale and grow um how how is it that you've successfully scaled discover strength what have been sort of the key tenants there yeah good question so i think lawrence one of the first not one of the first thing is is focus so focus means a lot of things but i don't mean focus in a cliched way i mean focus in understanding what your true strategic niche is and staying with that strategic niche and our strategic niche i mean for us it is evidence-based personalized strength training i mean stated otherwise we're doing high intensity training in a one-on-one or small group fashion and we will say no to anything else that comes our way that's outside of that strategic niche when you have a degree of success or when you've been doing something for a while and you start to get bored you start wanting to add other things and start trying other things and that is the death of all small and medium-sized businesses and sometimes it's the, the death of, of very large multinational corporations as well. But we would say that we've been able to stay very focused on that same strategic niche from the time that we were founded. So that's number one, is we do not get distracted by shiny stuff. Every single day we come to work and we only think about that strategic niche of evidence-based personalized strength training. And we know, we remind ourselves this, that as a company, our fortunes lie in evidence-based personalized strength training our fortunes we're not going to try to make another dollar somewhere else until we've made our fortunes in evidence-based personalized strength training so that's that's kind of the mindset and then the second thing and i just want to keep it simple the second thing is we understand and we've we've understood from day one that who comes before what so who you go to work with is more important than what you actually do. So who you come to work with is more important than the strategic decisions that you make and the tactical decisions that you make, which, of course, are very important. Now, I would say that there's too many organizations in all different industries that put the what before the who, and we focused on the who first. So that is true in all businesses, but, Lawrence, it is so much more true in a service-intensive business like the business that we're in. I mean, our focus as a leader, my focus is to make sure we have the absolute best personal training staff that our clients are interacting with. I mean, that is what we're selling. We're selling with inter- uh, interaction with this trainer, interaction with this person. And so the who has to come first. So we get really, really dialed in to understanding how we want to source our, our candidates, how we want to go through an interview process. When we hire them, what do we want to do to retain them, to keep them a part of our culture for the long haul? We want this trainer to be with us for a long time. How do we develop them? How do we take our... How do we take money? How do we take make investment in growing the trainer? Rather than buying a new machine or a few new machines, how do we take that money and invest it in the knowledge base and the experiences of our trainers? So that's really our obsession, and that hasn't changed in the last 10 years. So it's focus on what the strategic niche is, and number two, understand that who comes before what. And I think, this is just my opinion, if you want to be successful in this industry – 
you have to care about people first and you have to care about growing your trainers before anything else. I knew intuitively, you know, a very long time ago that no one ever wanted to work for me. No one wanted to work for Luke Carlson. They wanted to go to work and have a great career and great opportunities and autonomy to become masters of the craft and do something they were passionate about, which is my responsibility to create a structure and a framework where they could do that and do it in a way where they continue to grow. So let's make a, a, a sort of neat, well, I say neat segue, uh, it's hardly neat, but um, into into research. Um, James, you've been very patient um, and I wanted to I wanted to ask you some questions there. You both mentioned that, uh, James, you, you've been working on some new papers lately. Um, I'd love to hear what you've been focused on and what some of your findings have been there. Yeah, um, to be honest, you, you said about being patient. It's it's always interesting to hear Luke talk about his business, and and anybody who's not been there or not experienced it really needs to go and spend some time getting a workout and, and chatting with the trainers. Um, the first year I was there, I, I can remember sitting in a bar until I don't know when, drinking Guinness with Brandon on um, on uh, some Paddy's Day, and uh, and and he asked me some of the smartest questions that anybody has ever asked me about exercise science, and. Um, you know he's progressed within within Luke's company, so and it's true of all of Luke's trainers. So it's it's really it's it's great to hear about that. Um, my research doesn't sound very exciting in comparison to all of that. Um, there's been uh, wow, there's a flurry of papers through 2016 and and already a few in 2017. Um, you know we've looked at we've had a continuing kind of uh, uh, look at advanced training so some stuff we did with uh with luke and with discover strength like the breakdown set training and we looked at um negative accentuated um training so uh time accentuation of the negative phase and uh, negative only training and things like that with discover strength um We've looked at some neck training studies. We've looked at um, high load, low load training studies, and we did, we published a, a nice review in um, Sports Medicine, which uh, to me was a kind of a, you know, I kept getting a lot of people asking me, you know, about high load, low load. Why is there a difference in the in what the studies are saying? Whether you should train with a high load or a low load for um, for for hypertrophy or for strength, and and I guess it was. Uh, you know, it was an opinion article, um, but what we wanted to do is put something together with that, that kind of uh, discussed why different studies are finding different results. Um, you know, based on the different methods of measurement, whether they've used like a one rep max strength test or whether they've used isometric or isokinetic dynamometry, uh, whether they used um, whole muscle measurements, whether it's ultrasound or uh, MRI or whether they've used biopsy. And then we talked in, we talked a little bit around the idea of effort and discomfort. And in fact, that led us down a bit of a different direction as well. And that's become something that we've published a couple of papers on. So, so we published a paper towards the tail end of 2016 that was um, uh, the, just the, just getting clients to or, or us assessing whether clients can differentiate between effort and discomfort. So, effort, of course, is the effort applied to a given load, whereas discomfort is the feeling uh, of discomfort or perhaps sensations of pain in the muscle. Um, you know, there, a few guys have, have talked about this a long time ago um, in different studies, um, but maybe not applied it so well to resistance training. And, and probably a, a primary example is if you do uh, a one rep max, so a single repetition with the heaviest load you can, then arguably it's maximal and near maximal effort. But the degree of discomfort would be you know, relatively low. Whereas if you did as many repetitions as you can with, say, 30% of your one rep max, then you would still reach the same effort level when you reach failure. But the degree of discomfort would be, uh, well, considerably larger, some of our studies have shown. Um, so, yeah, so we've had a few papers around there. We published a paper in Muscle and Nerve recently that's um, clarity in uh, set endpoint terminology. So just... Um, just, you know, trying to, trying to be quite 
uh, succinct and quite clear about what it means to end a set of repetitions. So the idea of uh, not reaching repetition max, of reaching self-determined repetition max when somebody perceives they're going to reach failure in the next repetition, um, muscular failure or, or going beyond muscular failure with advanced techniques. And I think th these are, that was a really important paper because it's something that we've never really... And when I say we, I mean the exercise science community have never really clarified. Um, and I think that's been a big factor in when we compare resistance training studies. Um, and, you know, we've just published a paper in Frontiers in Physiology, which is a bit of a, a, a critical analysis of uh, meta-analyses. Um, and one of the key things within that is that the the idea of intensity of effort is um, is is seems to be secondary to the key factor, whether it's repetition duration or volume or rest interval or things like that. And in fact, the intensity of effort is actually probably the single most important variable that we can control. Um, and, and linked so closely with that is supervision ratio, which is never discussed in meta-analyses either. Um, and, you know, Luke will tell you with his, uh, with his training, one-on-one -on -one or, or, or small group training, that, uh, and the evidence will support it, that supervision ratio is absolutely uh, paramount to successful, um, successful workouts and really reaching the highest possible intensity of effort. If I could so, interject on that quickly, um, with, what would be the the main reason for that? Is that mainly to do with the Hawthorne effect? You know, because I, I agree, uh, I feel much more motivated. So, what what do you think are the main reasons why that's more effective? Having some, you know, I, I, so I lecture on personal training, and we provide personal training qualifications on the degree. And I would say the primary reason for that is is a safety factor, and and. Um, correction of technique. So I would say the first one is the, the actual technical ability to perform a good exercise. I think as intensity increases, technique uh, has the potential to decrease drastically. You know, we find a way to incorporate other muscles. This is why we see the big guy in the gym uh, or the guy in the gym trying to barbell curl something that he is never really going to move with strict form. But if he leans back far enough, then he creates enough of a lever um, from his upper body and, and, and changes the moment length and so forth and changes the biomechanics of the movement. Um, and actually, with a trainer, the trainer is going to stop him from doing that. So he's going to prevent that risk of injury first and foremost. Um, the, the second factor is when we train on our own, we really don't push ourselves to the same degree. And that might be that we don't use a load that we think that we can use. There have been studies with athletes, with rugby players, um, where people don't really don't use a heavy enough load um, and then train to, uh, to to the high enough degree of intensity. And, and even in even in small groups, you know, supervision ratio compared 1 to 25 to 1 to 5 have found 1 to 5 more favorable and even 1 to 1 more favorable than that and um, and I think a lot of the data that we have with the studies we've done with Discover Strength which have highlighted or have suggested there are, are no uh, greater benefits to uh, you know the advanced techniques of maybe pre-exhaustion or breakdown sets etc are probably because they're the first real studies where every single participant in the study has been trained on a one-to-one -one basis. So there is no kind of, there's no flaking out. There's no getting away with the last one, not performing the last one or two repetitions. Um, so even when people uh, in some studies say they're train, training to concentric failure, you know, I, I would question that. I really would. And, um, and I think that in, in the studies that we've done with Discover Strength, um, you know, we know that even the control group that have maybe just done reps to concentric failure, well, well they've trained to true concentric failure. So, um, you know, they've really reaped the benefits uh, of doing that properly. Um, so, yeah, I think that supervision ratio is just a huge factor. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and we've talked a bit about that in some of these studies as well, so... I had, an, I had a note here about um, obviously some of the the meta analysis is meta analyses. Oh, I can't even say the blooming word um, that have been published. I think some of some or one of which was from Brad. Um, I think Brad Schoenfeld. Um, you've mentioned there about you know a number of variables that aren't tracked 
perhaps in some of the studies that were looked at um, very well so intensity and supervision um, is that is that the main limitations of meta-analysis and strength training research or are there other <coughs> reasons why we should be cautious about those types well, of studies well f first and foremost i think i think that there's a place for meta-analyses i think if you you know if you're completely new to an area then a meta-analysis is probably a, a reasonable starting point but at the same time, it can really um, project uh, a false image of that area. And what I would, the reason I would say it's a good starting point is it's going to provide you with a reference list of the studies that they talk about that they've included. And, 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 and from there, I would suggest any reader of a meta-analysis go and read the empirical research themselves. Um, you know, I know that people don't have the time to do that, but I think that there's a lot to be gained by, by reading the actual studies themselves. And, and realistically, no, no two studies have really used the same population groups over the same duration uh, with the same genetic factors and the same movement velocity or the same uh, range of motion and things like this. So there are, there are always variables that are, that are not consistent across these studies. So you end up throwing in you know, anywhere between five and maybe 15 studies that are, that are similar but not the same um, and then trying to pull out one variable and one recommendation based on that variable. And it's, you know, I know that there are meta-analytical processes to try to account for the other variables, but I really don't think that can be done uh, appropriately with the area of resistance training. Um, and, and, and yeah, like you said, you know, we published this paper in Frontiers in Physiology uh, with a guy, Paolo Gentile, who I think you're going to get on the podcast at some point, right? Yes, we had a very amusing email exchange, if you remember. <laughs> I do indeed. I do indeed. Um, pa Paolo's uh, just a tremendous um, scientist and, uh, you know, strength training coach down in Brazil. And he lead authored this paper. Uh, and it really wasn't targeted at Brad. It was quite an interesting process. It really wasn't targeted at Brad or at any of the specific meta-analyses um, in resistance training. Um, uh, I say the specifics. It was targeted at resistance training. And, and like I said, we talked about intensity of effort. We talked about supervision ratio. We talked about movement velocity and muscle action. So, you know, a lot of the time people look at... Um, you know, growth of certain muscles, but they discount that those muscles have also been involved in other exercises. So the quadriceps are not, you know, taken out of the equation if we do a leg press. Um, and the same for the hamstrings or the triceps in a bench press or the biceps in a pull down exercise. Um, range of motion might be a big factor and repetition duration. Um, and even the method of measurement, whether it's one rep max or maximal isometric torque or uh, in vivo or in vitro, me me you know, methods of measuring um, um, hypertrophy. And, um, y you know, a lot of the independent studies that are put in maybe haven't controlled these. So it's not the, the responsibility of the or it's not the fault, I should say, of the authors of the meta-analyses. But. If the independent studies don't discuss this and haven't controlled this, then how can we know how they've impacted, well, one, that study, but two, the different studies all included in meta-analyses. So I'm just, you know, I, it sounds like I'm really kind of fighting against the idea. And, and in reality, I just want people to, to read things with an open, uh, with an open mind. Um, so yeah, so we've published a couple of papers uh, around around that concept. What was quite interesting is one of the reviewers commented back that we should be more specific with which meta-analyses we're critiquing. Uh, so we did, and, and we later found out that reviewer was James Krieger. Um, so I, I was quite quite surprised, but pleasantly surprised. You know, he's been an author of some of these meta-analyses, and you know, he seems like he's a, uh, you know. He, he, he was respectful to our argument so um, yeah I think that I think that these guys are doing a great job but I just think that people should be more cautious of it um, oh, oh, and I guess one of the key things is for me um, all the effort that's put into a meta-analysis could just be better redirected into a, um, into empirical research you know so for me that's the biggest thing Luke, you mentioned that you did a, a study or you're carrying out a study um, within Discover Strength comparing different 
rep durations and uh, protocol. Um, I think there's three different ones there. 10-10 rep duration versus 30-30-30 versus standard 2-4. Um, how did that go and what have been your findings from that? Well, James can comment really just as much as as I can, but we're we're just we're, we're too early to say anything because we don't have the data collection done. We probably have 25 to 30 subjects complete, um, but we're just not there yet. I mean, I can anecdotally comment on the training experience and what our clients have said about really pushing 30, 30, 30 um, over the long haul or sticking to a 10, 10 protocol over the long haul, but we just don't, we haven't looked and, and James and James have not analyzed the data yet. So we're a few months out from that yet. Okay, but anecdotally, what would you, have you can you comment or is it? I, yeah, I would comment right now and say that all groups have improved massively um, in their strength. And just so far, we've seen improvements in, in bod pod scores as well, which is never our main focus. The main focus is always um, strength. And James can comment on the study design and the strengths of the study design. Um, but we're, we look at this as very much real-world research that right now, and, and I may be taking away James's thunder. This is what I always, I always like to say about some of the projects that we've been involved with with James is we're trying to research the stuff that everybody debates and uh, opines around. And, and instead of continuing that conversation, we've decided to just actually do the research on it and starting to starting to put together a, a body of literature to point us in a particular direction. And I'll, I'll let James comment on that. Please do. <clears throat> yeah, you know, um, I mean, Discover Strength have really been instrumental in some of the studies published over the last few years, um, you know, especially with the advanced techniques, um, you know, so pre-exhaustion breakdown sets, negative accentuation, as we've talked about, um, as well as other things around um, motivation, uh, you know, participant motivation in, in, in different types of resistance training. Um, and for me, it's key because we, you know, as a scientist, we, you know, you know we've got uh, equipment within our labs and we can recruit participants and run, run research within our labs but ultimately we're a university so who, who are our participants well we kind of bully our students into things a little bit um so that you know our demographic is pretty much always 18 to 25 recreationally active or trained uh people um and, and it's you know it, it's not it's not re reflective of the real world so working with discover strength is just a fantastic opportunity to one have somebody do real one-on-one -on -one training sessions um, rather than prescribe exercise and hope people go away and do it properly or, or be limited to maybe one or two machines that we have. You know, they have the full, a full array of, of fantastic pieces there and a full array of trainers. Um, and they have real clients who, who are going through real nutritional habits and real lifetime stresses and, uh, uh, and real uh, jobs and things like that. So I think that, that I, I mean, I can't stress the importance for me that this is uh, real people in the real world uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, giving up their, uh, their their signing off their consent for this data to be to be published. Uh, this study about repetition duration is quite an interesting one because a lot of the previous studies, where we've where they've looked at. Um, extended uh, rep duration so if they look at the super slow cadences or anything like that then then a lot of people reduce the load down quite drastically um, and in fact what we've done is we've kept the load about the same across the groups so the the the, the time under load should be the same between all three groups. It should be approximately the same between all three groups. Obviously, there'll be a, a large number of repetitions in the um, shorter uh, rep duration groups. And, uh, you know, in the 30, 30, 30, there'll be, you know, you know, only, only one or two repetitions. So I guess to some extent, what we're actually looking at is the number of times we perform different muscle actions, you know, concentric and eccentric muscle actions, um, as well as whether there's, you know, and as a, as a part of that, whether there's a difference between performing 30-30-30 or 2-4 or 10-10, whether there is kind of an ideal uh, rep duration. And if Luke's got kind of anecdotal data of what the people think, then we'll probably try and gather some of that and include it as well because, you know, it's really important to, to include 
experiences in this, and this is where where I talked about effort and discomfort earlier. You know, finding out that that people can get the straight the same strength benefits from heavy and light loads is great. But finding out that people find light load resistance training incredibly painful, uh, you know, is going to steer people probably towards a more moderate, if not a heavier load. So I think that, you know, even variables like that are, are really important to look at. So, And we have Wayne Westcott on that study as well. And I have to throw that in there because this guy is just a, a legend in, uh, in exercise science and in strength training. And he's, uh, he, he's been involved in that research design and, and he'll be involved in the write-up as well. So, um, you know, it's just a, another great study that we've got on the go. Cool. Um, so we had a, a whole load of questions submitted, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but because it's my podcast, I get to ask my questions first. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> and it's a, a start off with a completely selfish one um, for you, James. So since the closure of my beloved Keys of London, um, which I used to train at, I found myself experimenting with working out at home, which I kind of started off you know, not really enjoying so much because I really fell in love with the MedEx machines. Um, mm-hmm. But I've kind of made it my mission to, um, you know, really uh, learn as much as I can about how to work out from home effectively. Um, found it very challenging, you know, the, the, the motive, trying to get the motivation to go to what I would consider true failure um, has been quite hard. Uh, and I found it difficult to Pro, uh, to improve from workout to workout obviously it's quite difficult to measure that over the short term because of the, the number of variables involved and uh, the, I guess the view that you can make you know you you're you're just your form improving but your mm-hmm. time under load staying static might still mean that you're improving you know it's stuff like that rather yeah. than seeing you know what I mean rather than seeing incremental improvements on time under load um but I just wondered, you know, uh, have you got any thoughts on, and I suppose this is to you as well, Luke, um, any thoughts on improving the efficacy of home workouts to make it easier to progress from workout to workout or at least over, a, I don't know, a, a sort of a biweekly um, schedule or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, wow. Wow. Um... <sighs> Do you know, home workouts is something that I really uh, mentally sort of struggle with. I know that James Steele uh, does a lot of this kind of thing, and I know Bill Simone has talked a bit about it in a previous podcast. Um, I, I think that, if possible, I would very much lean towards the use of advanced techniques um, to really reach reach muscular failure. So, so I know the studies we've talked about um, – have, have suggested that there might not be such a need for advanced techniques but I think that um, if training on my own or training at home then, then I see more of a benefit to make sure I reach true failure um, Richard Winnett was one of the first guys I ever heard really talk about his focus on in a workout is to improve the quality of each repetition. So he might not be looking for an in, you know an incremental increase in load or time under load, but the quality of the repetition. And I think that's a fantastic, you know, focus for a workout. Um, you know, I, 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 the short answer really is I have no idea. If you're doing a home workout, how you can see a progression from one workout to the next. Well, if you're doing push-ups and if you time them pretty strict and you can do more push-ups than you could the other workout, that's a progression. If you're able to do more and then add a static hold for longer, you know, things like that. I think it's... Um, you know, it's very mentally, it's very demanding, which is probably why I've yeah. never connected so well with with home workouts. Um, I've always found myself with a facility that I could train at. Uh, you know, partly because of of being a lecturer at the university where we have our own, you know, strength training facility. So, I suppose it's 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 it's, it's kind of. Um uh, it's it's difficult because I you know for instance with a um, let's say I'm doing a super slow chin up right um, and I'm you know each time I do it my form is improving so my turnarounds are much smoother um, mm-hmm. and my just my overall form is much better but you know if I were to look at my progress um, you know my my time under load is probably always around a minute you know regardless of my cadence (laughs) which is my fault that i don't probably measure that variable accurately enough um 
but it's it's sometimes i think okay so maybe my form is improving but my my time under load seems to be staying static you know do i need more recovery between workouts you know i have i work out at the moment once a week i do play basketball around that um so kind of every seven seven to nine days um do you think there'd be any uh, any reason to potentially um, increase that recovery window or do you think that wouldn't be necessary? Uh, I, I personally don't think you probably need to increase that beyond once a week. It, depend, it depends on other stresses in your life. Um, but, I, I, you know, I think if, if it was once per week and it was a home workout, I would really struggle with the kind of enjoyment of my training uh, from that perspective. So, um, you, you know, you could try it. In, in my trial and error, my N equals one research study that's gone on for 38 years, <laughs> uh, uh, I've trained uh, the, the minimal frequency. Some exercises probably want down to once every 21 days, once every three weeks, um, and found that that was way too infrequent for me. I mean, I was I was going down to you know real um, quite abstract split routines just to try to put some some other kind of workout in um, once a week or once every like five or six days. Um, I think training once a week is is great for people that don't have time. I would probably push it to twice a week for for most people and say that they've probably got the recovery capacity for that, depending on the volume performed within that workout. So I guess I would ask, how many exercises are you doing in a workout, Lawrence? It's probably somewhere between five and eight. So I suppose if I was doing twice a week, I'd be doing like an A-B routine, which is lower volume, I suppose. So I, I, I guess I kind of wonder if there might be more to be said for um, finding kind of maybe three or four key exercises and even going to twice or three times a week and maybe having less variation in the exercise, but going to a higher frequency. Um, with regards to home workouts, I've done a bit of work with a guy called Jeff Barron, who's based in Manchester, and he has uh, what he calls a micro gym where you basically apply, you, you use the contralateral limb um, for resistance. And I demoed this at one of Luke's conferences a couple of years back, actually. And we just had a paper published um, towards the tail end of 2016, um, looking at the kind of the acute uh, muscle activation um, or electrical amplitude, which is, uh, you know, ideally representative of muscle activation. Um, I, and basically, a good example might be if I put my uh, left hand across in front of my body with my elbow bent, so my palm is kind of in line with my chest and my elbow is about shoulder height, and I do the same with my right hand, and I, now I press them against each other, then you know my left, my left arm is resisting my right arm. Now, if I do, if I press maximally there, then you know, I'm recruiting all motor units and muscle fibers. Uh, if I allow my left arm to uh, to horizontally abduct or horizontally extend, so basically rotate towards my left um, while still pushing maximally and then rotate back towards my right and so forth, um, then, you know, you can perform exercises like that um, maximally and it almost doesn't matter whether you're seeing an in an increase in um time because you're performing a maximal exercise um so you know i know a lot of exercises like um a push-up like a wall sit um like a pull-up or a chin-up you know we look for an increase in performance or improvement in performance whereas actually um if you consider say uh, a seated um adduction exercise if you put a foam roller between your thighs and you squeeze it as hard as you can for 60 seconds well you don't need to squeeze it as hard as you can for 65 seconds to see an improvement you just need to squeeze it maximally so as long as you're working maximally then you're recruiting available motor units and muscle fibers and you're probably you know optimizing uh you know your workout through that process Luke, if that makes sense <laughs> yeah so no it does it does it does i was just saying uh luke were you doing the actual actual uh exercises that james was describing i'm sort of standing here doing it whilst he was describing it 
<laughs> I'm, I'm not, but I watched him do that demo with, uh, with one of our people a few years ago at, at the conference. So I know what he's, re- you know, referencing. Cool. Um, question for you, Luke, uh, thoughts on when the best time to train is. And I wondered whether you had any, I guess, data on this or even anecdotal data from your gym. Um, when do you find, do, do you find that clients, um, perform best at a specific pot time in the day so in the morning afternoon or evening is there any evidence to support an optimal time for strength training james you can give your comment as soon as i give my anec- anecdotal comment but i okay. think that the time that's the best to train is the time where you feel the peak mental readiness so when you are hungry for your workout and you are in a psychological state where you can provide a maximal level level of effort so that is you have to take into account are we talking early a.m um later in the morning midday evening but not just the time of day but how it impacts the rest of your day in terms of the other stressors in your day uh do you feel like you can give the best effort because you're at a peak psychological readiness after your work day because you're done with the work day or is it before your work day because the stress of the work day hasn't set in what are the different environmental factors that contribute to you getting in what Mahali Csikszentmihalyi would call a flow state are you in a flow state during your training where you can maximize your focus and your efforts and your intensity now James can totally refute everything I'm saying by citing a few <laughs> studies that say 5.30 a.m. is the best time but but I would say anecdotally that it's different for 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 everybody. Uh, the key is to understand when you're able to provide the best effort. Because as all of your listeners know, we're talking about strength training on an infrequent basis. So if you're only going to train once a week or for the extremist once every 10 days or once every four to five days, you're still not training very often. So it's important to maximize that session, maximize the focus that leads into that session. And that's why I think it's worthwhile to really find that ideal time. I'm going to contrast that with someone who's training with much more volume. So let's not even use strength training as an example. If you're training for a marathon, for example, and you're running five, six, seven days per week, sometimes you just have to get that run in whenever your day will allow. And I don't think you absolutely have to maximize the timing of that run because it's just not going to be realistic. But when you're only strength training, when you're only resistance training one to two times per week, it's worth the planning to find the optimal time for, for that particular individual. James, do you have a view on that? Um, yeah, so uh, uh, Luke's put me on the spot a bit there. There, there is a probably almost certainly uh, some, probably almost certainly that, that doesn't make sense, but um, <laughs> some research out there looking at circadian rhythms. Um, but you know, I think that Luke's probably touched upon the more important variables there of when people feel ready to exercise. And and you know what? Rather than give you. Uh, a scientist approach. I'm, I'm going to tell the listeners what I do. Um, so uh, I, I generally try to, I don't try to fast to midday, but I, I'm not a big fan of breakfast. I love breakfast food. Like as a food type is probably my favorite. Um, but I, the last thing I want to do when I wake up in the morning is start eating. And, and Luke will attest to that. Uh, Luke, uh, when he visited me in the UK uh, a couple of years back, uh, passed a comment that he's probably gone the longest ever in his life without eating a meal while he was in my company. James tried to starve me to death. <laughs> <laughs> um, I never train fasted. So I know that James Steele is a big fan of this. I know a few other people are, are big proponents of this. I don't. I don't like it. I don't feel like I like it's productive for me. Um, I generally train well late morning or early afternoon, um, and uh, in alignment with what Luke said, when I, for me, I feel better when I know the days kind of stresses are done so right now during my teaching schedule most of my classes are morning so i would never go in and train before those classes um i would always get those classes and get any meetings i have to get done out of the way and then i would get my workout in after that Um, with the only exception of uh when food is being provided in the meeting and then i'll get a workout in immediately before so i can go in and feast 
do you know what just a quick side note um i know doug mcguff um i, th- I think he we, we talked about this on my podcast before um which is that he he i don't know if he still does this but he was fasting several hours after the workout and my understanding is his 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 reason for doing that was so as to not um interrupt i believe the the kind of amplification cascade that is triggered following a workout so you know the replete the um uh because recycling of um, no, sorry, the um, depletion of muscle glycogen during the workout, but then um, the, the the kind of fat loss that can occur following. Um, so not, yeah. not to sabotage that is my understanding. Do you uh, do you guys have a view on that? Do you do you think that has any kind of merit at this point? So I would uh, sorry to interrupt, Luke. Um, so I would say that. Um, if I have eaten sort of immediately before a workout, so if I have like a protein bar just before a workout, which I quite often do, or if I have a protein shake during the workout, then I might not eat immediately or I might not eat for the next two or three hours afterwards. I don't necessarily feel the need to fuel immediately afterwards. What I would say is I I, I try to make sure I have a, um, a reasonable intake of protein around the time of my workout, whether that's before during or after is you know just down to convenience for me what are your thoughts luke so i I would of course defer to you but the approach that we use is really reflected and you can you can carry this forward when you interview brad um branch uh brad schoenfeld just did a a paper um that he published geez a matter of a few weeks ago um pre versus post exercise protein intake and the, the impact on muscular adaptations and so we basically would recommend and i say that we do it but i do the same thing hey hey one one thing i would say lawrence is I have only one thing in the world in common with Steve Jobs, and that is everything Steve Jobs ever built at Apple, he really built it because he wanted to use it himself. He built it because it was something he was interested in. So sometimes I say we, but honestly, it's it's just me. I mean, I'm doing everything that our clients are doing and vice versa. So um, we would recommend having protein around the time of the workout and our standard recommendation and, and Brad's latest paper supports this is is maybe 20 grams of protein before the workout, during the workout itself, or after the workout. And we've provided a window that we want to be about 30 minutes before, 30 minutes after. His most recent paper would suggest that maybe that window – Actually, his 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 opining suggests that maybe you could go um, even a broader window. The paper itself supports protein directly before or directly after being of the same value, and I, I think that actually makes intuitive sense. So that's what we would do: is twenty grams of protein. And and I know uh, James Fisher has done this before. But I'll literally open up the protein drink right as the workout starts and just take a sip on it throughout the entire workout. So I'll have a little bit of water, then I'll go back to the protein drink and a little bit of water uh, as the workout continues. So moving on to some questions submitted by by listeners. Um, I won't be doing name attributions because we'll probably be here all day. Um, James, what's your opinion on accentuated uh, negative work, um, either accentuated via cadence control or hyperloading, which I'm assuming means very heavy loads? Wow. Okay. So, yeah, this is this has really been a growing a growing area um, with the use of X Force and, and things like this, and and I know that you know. You know, Arthur Jones talked about this a long time back with with negative only training. Um, I, I see a place for it. I think it's nice for variation. Uh, there are some great studies that suggest that um, uh, you, you know there could be a benefit to a, a heavier load during the eccentric phase. Um, there was one published, literally weeks after we published a study that suggested there was no greater benefit to eccentric only or eccentric time accentuated training there was a paper that suggested that there might be um a a benefit to a heavier load during the eccentric phase 
Um, but to be honest, um, I, I don't think it's personally. I don't think it's necessary. Is it? Is it? Is it great fun? You know, I've tried X Force equipment and and I love it. I think Builder Simone put it the best when he said, um, you know, in the eccentric phase, a lot of the time when we uh, accentuate the time in the eccentric phase, we actually provide the body with a, bit, a little bit of a rest because the load is the same and it's that bit easier. Um, whereas with X Force or anything where we have um, a heavier load. Um, in the eccentric phase, then we, um, you know, there's nowhere to hide. Uh, you know, you, you can really feel that. Um, there are quite a few uh, companies that do similar products. Um, X-Force's tilting weight stack is, is pretty novel. It's, it makes it pretty expensive, and it makes it um, uh, pretty... Uh, Juicy, I guess, from uh, from the use of electricity. Um, I've heard different things on that it requires different um, voltages and fuse boxes being put into facilities and things like this. I don't know whether there's any truth in any of that. Um, there's a few that work on pneumatic resistance to accentuate the the negative phase, and you know they're all built on the same principle that if you accentuate the load, you you can uh, you know improve the workout. I personally. I don't think there's anything to be gained by it, but I think that um, uh, that is if people are training to to true muscular failure. Um, if they're not training to muscular failure, then yeah, there might be some advantages to it. Luke, do you have a view on this one as well? So I would say that I, I've been a little bit um, almost heartbroken, and I, I say that... Uh, almost jokingly that with the results of our, our eccentric only and eccentric time uh, accentuated or extended study and that we didn't see better results from the negative only or eccentric only group. I will say anecdotally that we still, and I think James would echo this, we still love to include some negative, what we would call negative only work, negative emphasis work, negative accentuated work. So all different types of focusing on eccentric work in all of our workouts, and we definitely think there's value there. And we think that for the average participant that maybe has a difficult time getting to true concentric failure, there may be even additional benefits uh, for that population or for those individuals. Now, all that being said, in my own workouts and with our clients' work, client workouts, and if I'm trying to produce the best results with someone, we're going to include uh, plenty of negative work. I've been through, I think, three or four full X-Force workouts myself, and I love the equipment, and I love the, the heavy the heavy eccentric, those were absolutely tremendous workouts. James was with us uh, at Gainesville Health and Fitness in Gainesville, Florida, one of the few places in the U.S. that has X-Force equipment. When we went through a full workout in November 2014, it was a tremendous workout. Um, and then uh, in my own workout, so I, I, I did a workout on Monday, and the workout involved a decent amount of negative work. So the workout was body weight chin ups just normal repetitions immediately followed by body weight dips just normal repetitions to failure and then a medics leg press just normal repetitions to failure with um, some some advanced technique afterwards what we did is we changed the range of motion by moving the seat back so i was doing less mechanical work and went to failure again with the seat in a different position then i went back to the chin ups and i did with with weight around my waist i did a set of negative only chin ups six reps of negative only chin ups and then six reps of negative only dips and six being the target i, I think i really failed right around six or seven so we're always including negative only and negative accentuated and negative emphasis throughout our throughout our workouts what well, luke can i ask what was the rep duration on your uh, negative only chin ups they were all 10 seconds. Okay. And the set would be terminated or we would no longer count the repetition as soon as you couldn't evenly pace the 10 seconds. So even if you were getting 10 seconds and it was no longer an evenly paced 10 seconds, it didn't count. We still continued the set until you couldn't control yourself for even four or five seconds on that, that negative. So it was true uh, eccentric failure. 
But yeah. uh, if we were recording that workout, we'd only record the reps that were in evenly paced, and that's the same design that we had when we we did the study over over a year ago. So. Mm-hmm. I would add to my earlier comment, you know, I, I don't want to sound like I'm, <laughs> I don't want to sound like I'm changing my mind, um, but I also don't want to sound like I'm just taking apart the idea of using negative accentuated training. Um, I'm, I'm a really big fan of, um, for knee extensions, um, for pull downs, things like that, two hands uh, or bilateral, concentric, unilateral, eccentric. So for a knee extension, lifting the load with both legs and then lowering it with one. Uh, and for a pull down, um, we've got a Nautilus Nitro Evo pull down. And, and to me, it's fantastic to do a, a bilateral uh, concentric phase and then release one one handle and do an, an eccentric with one hand. Um, but but again, do I think it's necessary? Probably not. Do I think it's, it's great fun? Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, James, what's your opinion on the the cumulative effect of minimal or no rest in between exercises in a workout yeah you know i think this is a really interesting area and i think it's really down to an individual um if you if you go over to luke's place he's gonna he's gonna move you from one exercise to the next pretty quick um maybe maybe not as quick as some other places um but but it's gonna move pretty quick um I have a tendency when I train on my own to be a little bit more lazy fair over it. Um, it's not that I specifically time a rest interval. It's just that I move at my own pace. Um, and, I, and I've got the luxury of doing that because it's, I'm either training at my own university where we've got our own facility or if I'm training in a commercial gym, um, then I might have to wait for a specific piece of equipment anyway. Um, my workouts are generally 30 to 45 minutes anyway, um, and they're probably a similar volume to what Luke would prescribe as maybe uh, 12 exercises, 10 or 12 exercises um, in, in his 30-minute workouts. So, yeah, I think that there's a lot to be said for it. Um, I think from a cardiorespiratory uh, from a metabolic factor, I think it's fantastic. I think move quickly between exercises, get it done. I know that people are fearful of it because it maybe reduces the load that they're going to use in later exercises. But I don't think that makes any difference at all. Um, so yeah, I think if it suits you, if you you know if you're when I'm time precious and I go in, if I have 20 minutes to, to do a workout, I'm going to you know move really quick between the exercises. I'm going to use machines that I can just change the, the pin on uh, and move between them pretty quick. Nothing that I have to load or unload plates on um, or anything like that. So, um, but other times, you know, I'm going to move at my own pace. My 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 caveat to all of that is and I, I would almost never let a workout exceed 45 minutes um the research i read a long time back i couldn't tell you who it was by or or or, or the study in any detail but suggested that around 45 minutes our cortisol levels are spiking so much so our stress hormones are spiking so much that we're really probably doing more harm than good for anything over that time um you know which goes against a lot of people uh, following the kind of typical bodybuilding workouts of two hours at a time so yeah that's interesting because i'm just thinking even when i do my home home workout you know, single set to failure five to eight, eight exercises i just can't bring it towards the end i'm just so there's so much systemic fatigue i feel so exhausted um, yeah also it depends on my day you know if i've had a stressful day in the office um but it, another reason why perhaps I should look at a consolidated routine, like we mentioned earlier, um, Luke. What, what, what you know, you you, you like uh, James Hinnon out there. You move your your clients through their routines quite quickly. Uh, what's the you know what's your kind of uh, rationale for that, and, and why do you think that's a benefit? Well, Lauren, sometimes I actually feel bad for our clients as we're. <laughs> Um, from exercise to exercise because it's brutal. I, I, in my own workouts, I didn't really know this, James. I'm very similar to James in the regard that in my own workouts, I move fairly slowly from exercise to exercise. I fear being trained by a colleague when I know that they're going to force me to move quickly from exercise to exercise. I was in Florida just uh, two weeks ago, and Jim Flanagan took me through a workout, and I knew he was really going to push the pace on me, and he did, and I was like, you know, I dreaded ahead of time, and the workout itself is is brutal. Um, that's just not 
something that I enjoy. I do think that you need to have enough rest between sets so that you are truly failing on the exercise because of skeletal muscle fatigue or failure, not you're breathing so hard and you're so uncomfortable and there's these this metabolic fatigue that's causing you to terminate the set. And we've all seen particularly strong males deal with that, whereas the workout continues, they're terminating the set because just in general, they are metabolically spent and not because their biceps are truly at concentric muscle failure. So we will always take enough time so that you're recovered and you're able to provide your best effort on that set. Um, so that that's always the focus. In my own workouts, I often, at least half the time, will train – I mean, 100% of the time I'm training with one of our trainers or if I'm traveling, it's training with another colleague. But at least half the time, I will go every other exercise. So I will do an exercise myself and then when my set is done, I'll move to, to my coworker and they'll do the exercise and we'll go to failure and then we'll go back and forth. So in that case, I'm getting 90 seconds to two minutes or even more uh, rest in between. And so I'm spoiled in that regard. And when I move to just moving from exercise to exercise, it uh, it's brutal. Uh, but at the same time, I'm maybe not always concerned whether or not I'm getting the absolute optimal cardiorespiratory adaptation from the workouts because I know that I'm doing some additional cardio during the week because I'm a runner and I'm always training for marathons, etc. Can, can I add to that? Because um, that was interesting that Luke commented about when he trains with a partner that there's a maybe 90 second to two minute rest. So I, I'm, I'm, I actually struggle with that rest time. To me, mentally, I actually switch off in the workout. Um, even though I'm training that other person or I'm, you know, spotting that exercise. Um, I find it then difficult to mentally switch back on for the next exercise. So I don't know if that, if Luke's experienced that. I, I personally, if you were to time on my rest interval between exercises, it's probably 30 to 60 seconds, which arguably in the literature is reasonably quick. It's certainly not the NSCA, you know, three to five minute rest interval between uh, between exercises. So I think that where we perceive that to be a while, quite a rest, actually that's not a long rest. <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. And, and I'll also add, Lawrence, that we will, when I train like that, we will still have specific sequences where there is absolutely no rest because that's the effect we're trying to produce. So it may be a pre-exhaust, it may be a post-exhaust, it may be a triple pre-exhaust. So like a favorite chest sequence would be doing a pec fly movement followed by a chest press movement back into a pec fly or a chest press movement into a pec fly into dips or negative only dips so in that sense we will move absolutely as fast as possible in between but then we'll just maybe take rest before we start the next sequence or the next exercise or the next body part if you will so it sounds like from what you're saying that there's from what both of you are saying that there's doesn't sound like there's much in the way of a difference on the effects on ter in terms of things like hypertrophy whether you do one or the other is that a fair statement at this time so whether you go fast between exercises or you have two minutes between, it really doesn't make much of a difference. I don't, I don't think there's any difference. Um, I, I know that you know you're going to have Brad on here in a few in in whenever, and I think he probably does think there's a difference. Um, but I think a lot of this is psychological over feeling the need to lift a heavy weight. You know, if I go in the gym and I want to lift and I want to, uh, you know. I don't know, put a certain load on a, on a leg press, then I might choose to do that exercise first, or I might choose to do that exercise after a reasonable enough rest between exercises. But actually, I don't think there's any, any need for that rest. I don't think there's any hypertrophic, any change in hypertrophic adaptation. Right. So this is the, one of the million dollar questions um, in the kind of, Ex or I should say sort of high intensity training versus high volume world um, which is one from Fred uh, he asks is there any evidence that multiple sets of the same exercise done to momentary muscular failure are superior um, for hypertrophy versus single sets to failure 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to say there is no study that's ever done that because I don't believe that any of the studies that have done single versus multiple sets have have truly, bar one, have truly taken people to... Um, um, to concentric failure in the multiple set condition the bar one is that we did a study using the medex lumbar extension and we had people uh, we had participants perform three sets to concentric failure um which is absolutely brutal and probably in hindsight quite unethical um and no there was absolutely no no benefit um uh compared to the single set group uh, for strength, I, I don't know if you said for strength of hypertrophy. Uh, hypertrophy um, mainly, be interested in. Uh, no, I don't think there's anything that's ever empirically tested that because I don't believe any of the studies have really, truly looked at concent uh, concentric failure. Um, so I'm just going to say there's no evidence. <laughs> let, let, let me just add that I, I'm going to piggyback on what James said about uh, groups going to muscle failure. So... I'm always surprised, and, and James, you can tell me if you disagree, with the number of study designs that involve three sets for each exercise performed to a momentary muscle failure, and maybe they're doing 10 exercises in that, in that workout or eight exercises. So if you're doing three sets to failure, eight exercises, I mean, you're doing 24, if you're doing 10 exercises, you're doing 30 sets to absolute momentary muscle failure. If you've truly trained a momentary muscle failure through a full body workout, I mean, in the words of Arthur Jones, a paraphrase, 30 sets to momentary muscle failure would put a well-conditioned gorilla into the hospital. I mean, it's, it's, it's brutal to think about. And so I... Uh, I question what momentary muscle failure looks like in some of these study designs because if you're really taking people to momentary muscle failure for 24 to 30 sets three times per week in most of these study designs, I, I would guess that 70% of the study participants would drop from that study. I mean, that is absolutely brutal. And I know that your listenership, Lawrence, can can empathize with that because we're, we're talking six exercises, 10 exercises to true, absolute momentary muscle failure. And, and sometimes that can even feel just devastating following following the workout. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I think probably the most significant study that's looked at this area was an Ostrowski study but from about 1997. Um, I think I have a feeling there, are, uh, there were Australian authors and they looked at, um, uh, I think it was one, two or three sets per exercise um, and just a, a full body, like, a, like truly a full body workout and, and it cited... Um, I think it cited concentric failure, and it, and it really highlighted no differences between the groups um, across the board. There may have been like a difference for one exercise or for one muscle group. I can't recall it off the top of my head now. Um, but but to be honest, you know, again, training to concentric training to true muscular failure for a handful of exercises is brutal. Doing it over and over again is just cruel. <laughs> So, so I, I cited uh, Brad's recent paper and talking about protein around the workout, and we think it's a good paper, and, and it obviously is part of the, the supporting evidence to our practices in terms of protein timing. But in that study, they used three sets of each exercise, nine exercises, three times per week. That's 81 sets to failure per week on a total body workout. I mean, to me, that is absolutely brutal. And, and I might even say, without questioning Brad, I might even say seemingly um, unrealistic. So, so are you telling me that if it's like a free sets on a bench press, each one of those sets is going to failure? Is that what you mean? Correct. Yep, that's how the study is written. And then the weight is just adjusted so that each time the participant is failing in between 8 to 12 repetitions. So the load would probably decrease after the first set, definitely after the second set. So they're failing within the 8 to 12 uh, rep range. Okay. Now, would it be fair to say then that aside from maybe 
taking my home workout example as an example uh, aside from maybe making it you know if you don't reach failure in your first set therefore a second set maybe helps you to um go to failure and provide uh, and and um create more inroad aside from that there doesn't seem to be any value in drop sets or rest pause if what you're both saying is true from from the evidence is that fair to say yeah I, I, well from a physiological standpoint yeah i would I, I think that's fair to say i think that there probably aren't any greater adaptations uh from a strength or a hypertrophy perspective from doing breakdown sets or drop sets or, or doing uh rest pause training what, what i would say is that those things you know add add the likelihood of a person reaching muscular failure um and they add interest to the workout, motivation, variation, things like that. So, you know, are, are they completely necessary? Well, if we're, you know, if we look at what's only strictly functional in a workout, then, yeah, maybe we would all just do a single set of each exercise to concentric failure and we'd never need anything else. But, you know, if that's the case, we wouldn't have so many different brands of car because there'd be no need. We'd all just have the same car that got us from the same... <laughs> place to another at the same speed and w with the same function you know we don't have any need for that but personal tastes and personal variances dictate differences so um you know breakdown sets i love breakdown sets i do i feel like i do breakdown sets virtually every workout ever since i published a paper that said there's probably no need for them <laughs> you're making me realize uh, i've become way too much of an objectivist i think um i've been watching too much mike mensa seminars on youtube i think you know uh, jay <laughs> James Steele, sorry to interrupt, Lawrence. That's James right. Steele is, is a great example of somebody who can almost just look at things from a completely logical and rational perspective and do only what's functional and nothing more. Um, he just is, um, you know, I mean, it's almost robotic in its process. And it's amazing to think that this guy actually has such a, a great personality and is really quite fun to be around. But when it comes to his workout or it comes to nutrition, it's just you know so um just so rational <laughs> <laughs> yeah i completely know what you mean <laughs> yeah. um, okay so uh right and let me just cons uh, let me just absorb this one quickly lawrence i would i would add yeah, to that say, mm. I, I, if there's a continuum james Steele is on the far 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 right of the continuum but if that continuum is like a mile in length James Fisher is still like seven inches away from James Steele relative to the rest of the world on that continuum. And so, so I, I think my take home message on all of it is I appreciate uh, James Steele's approach and I love James Steele. James, when you listen to this, I love you. But I, I, I think the, the, the mandate for the exercise professional, for the practitioner, is to continue to operate under the umbrella of an evidence-based approach, which really gives us a tremendous amount of freedom in what we can do. And so that, that's always been my personal approach, and that increases my own fervor and excitement and engagement in my own training is let's use a few of the different tools and approaches and uh, techniques and protocol that fall under that evidence-based umbrella. Cool. Okay. Um, so... Uh a question for you again, actually, Luke. Um, how, is, how has your thinking evolved in terms of the optimal or practical amount of frequency and volume of exercise, assuming intensity is fixed, so single set to failure? How has that evolved over the last, say, year from your perspective? Well, I'm, I'm going to take you back even further. I'm going to say over the last 17 years, Go for it. 18 years, I would say that it went from that you could do a, a hard workout three times per week, and that gradually dropped to two times per week. And I, like so many of your listeners, entertained the idea of once every seven to ten days or once every 14 days back to once every seven days, six days, five days. Now to thinking that the recommendation for the vast majority of trainees that twice per week is probably optimal. And if it's not twice per week, week 
it's once every four to five days. So if someone wants a blanket recommendation as to where they should start or what's going to optimize both strength and hypertrophy, it is it is almost always twice per week. And one of the reasons that I say that is we have so many clients. I mean, I mean, literally, I can give you hundreds and hundreds of examples of clients who train consistently once per week, train very, very hard with great form, on great equipment, under great supervision over the long haul. And then for a month period, we'll do one of our programs where they focus on training twice per week, so just twice per week for four weeks, and they always, in their pre- and post-tests, in terms of body composition, always improve their body composition. And I realize that using a bod pod is not the absolute optimal way to measure hypertrophy, but it's remarkable how these people can train once per week for so long, make good progress, jump to twice per week, and really break through the uh, quote-unquote plateau and and lose body fat. Of course, they're, they're really focused on their overall caloric intake, but really increase their lean tissue over that month-long period by increasing the frequency for that period of time. So just anecdotally over the long haul, I went from three times a week thinking that was optimal, moving down to once every 10 to 14 days, as many of your listeners are, 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 are probably very familiar with. And then I've migrated back toward once every three, four, or five days. I'm assuming that those clients you mentioned, were they doing I think, a- um, can I add to that, Lawrence? Yeah, so I go for it. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's really interesting because I think when you change up a workout by any dynamic, you you um, change the stresses on the body, so you kind of uh, change the potential for adaptation. Um, so I think that going from a, a workout once a week where people have seen improvements to suddenly doing twice a week, you might see more drastic improvements or vice versa, you know, adding more rest in uh, as well, um, things like that. I, I've, I've, you know, done everything under the sun from back in the day when I would do, you know, uh, really five day split routines um and i could train in the morning and then go back in the gym in the afternoon because i would kind of work in there or pass back through it um as part of uh, you know my time at university um i found most people do well from two workouts a week most people don't want to do any more than two workouts a week and won't, won't benefit from it and people that are only training once a week are probably doing it from a time perspective and they're probably getting close to optimal results but i but i would always favor a lower volume and a higher frequency within reason um i had an interesting dialogue with wayne westcott and, and james Steele and, and jürgen giesing a german author and paulo um uh, gentile over in brazil and we um We've been we've been having this dialogue over over you know kind of not the optimal workout but the minimalist workout, and we wonder if uh, uh, an overhead press, um, a leg pr- sorry a pull down, a leg press, and a chest press are um, kind of the three key exercises. In fact, I'm going to change that to a seated row rather than a pull down because we were talking that some people might have shoulder mobility issues um, with an overhead press or a pull down. So the three exercises, again, a chest press, a seated row and a leg press might be um, an absolute minimal all that's necessary. But if you're only doing those three exercises, then you might be fine to train maybe three times a week. So again, with that kind of diminished volume, if only being performed for a single set without advanced techniques like rest pause or breakdown sets and so forth, you know, uh, th- three times a week might be might be good. Um, and there are certainly some people who will benefit from a higher frequency or can, can handle a higher frequency, whether they benefit or not, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I've trained... Uh, by experience, females recover, some females inc- recover incredibly quickly from a workout. So uh, I, I think there's a real variation, an, in, an individual variation around that. So, Theoretical perfection and dogma aside, what a way to start a question. Um, what is the best... <laughs> Uh, most practical way for someone in their 40s juggling work kids and other responsibilities to build muscle with a side helping of health and aerobic fitness 
So I guess what is the optimal exercise routine or practice for someone who has a lifestyle like that, in your opinion? James, do you, do you, oh, want, you want to go well, first, and then uh, I'll I'll give you some ramblings about this after you give it from a very scientific standpoint. <laughs> well, I was going to say, doesn't this fit with your Mary or um, is it Mark or Mike? I don't remember. Michael, Michael, don't forget, don't forget about Michael. You're always more interested in Mary. I know. <laughs> I don't know why that is. She's just <laughs> way, way, way more, way closer to my demographic. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, sorry, my mind's gone on a complete tangent now. Um, optimal workout for building muscle, cardiovascular fitness, health for somebody who is what short on time. Essentially, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I would. You know what? I would come back to what I just said. I would really go for one. The first thing that people don't appreciate is weight stack or selectorized resistance machines don't spend time loading and unloading plates from a barbell to do a deadlift or a bench press or a squat or or even uh, or anything like that Pla- even plate loaded resistance machines there's a, there's a time loss in this process um, go straight to a selectorized resistance machine definitely hit a leg press and probably hit that first in the workout because uh, you need to be pretty fresh to get a good a good session on a leg press um, and you're going to hit so much muscle mass in that process, and and metabolically, your heart rate. If you do it properly, at a good, a good cadence, um, um, and you do it to failure, your heart rate is probably going to shoot to like 160 plus. Maybe you, you know you, you're going to be looking at probably close to 80 percent of your maximum heart rate, um, or you should be if you're doing it right. Um, I then add in a chest press. Uh, an overhead press, a seated row, uh, and a pull down. Uh, if possible, I'd put in a leg curl and a leg extension. Um, although they might not be as necessary, um, I would then throw in um, a low back exercise. So ideally, um, something that really isolates the low back. Uh, you know, even a Roman chair, if done properly, can can be pretty good. But ideally, you know, a, a, a medex, a lumbar extension, uh, something for uh, trunk flexion to train the abdominals, um, and then maybe something around torso rotation. So really, try and hit every muscle. Um, but not necessarily with repeated actions. I, I mean, I'm not talking about a chest press, an incline press, a pec fly, and then dips. I mean, just hit, uh, you know, those those maybe nine or ten exercises. I don't even know how many there were um, for, a, for a single set to concentric failure. And I would say twice a week. Do it twice a week. I, I reckon you could probably get that workout done. If you're under tension for each exercise for 60 seconds, for 10, for 10 exercises, that's six minutes. Even if you rest, um, uh, sorry, that's 10 minutes. If you um, rest a minute between each exercise, you're looking at what, 19 minutes? That's two 20 minute workouts a week. Boom, get it done. Uh, I think that's probably going to be the, the, the way to go. What do you think, Luke? So, yeah, obviously, I, I echo so much of that. Uh, I give a talk over and over. It's a three-hour workshop to CEOs of, of companies of all sizes. And I give the presentation, like this year, I'll give it, I think, 45 times throughout the U.S. and Canada. And we use the filter of essentialism. So there's a book written by, actually, a, a British author, Greg McEwen. And the book is called Essentialism. And so the framework is uh, how do you cut out everything that's superfluous, that is that is extra, and really dial into what is the essential activity. So the concept of doing less but doing it better. And so I, I try to dial in what is what constitutes essential exercise for the high-performing, time-strapped, uh, as Peter Drucker would, would say, knowledge worker, the white-collar worker, um, the, the busy executive. And for me, it's very similar to what James said. The only variation I could potentially add was one strength training workout that is 30 minutes in length, 10 to 11 exercises, very similar to exercises to what James said, and then potentially one higher-intensity um, anaerobic uh, 
uh, workout as well. So some type of interval training format. And one of the reasons I'm quick to make that recommendation is I think it prepares people for the different things that they're going to encounter in their lives. So you can quickly and easily make a transition to going on a, a hiking trip and uh, jumping into a 5K as a part of a charity event and doing these other things. Um, even uh, you're p- playing pickup basketball and you want to improve your conditioning for basketball, doing that 30-minute um, bout of anaerobic work with higher level of intensity, um, sprinting, for example, if you're on a treadmill or if you're running outside, can be valuable. So we would call that essential exercise, the one strength training workout per week, or the one bout of higher intensity interval workout per week. And that's the foundation. And we'd say beyond that, if you want to ski and go on runs and bike rides and hike and play a, a variety of recreational sports, go ahead and add those on top of that. But that is the foundation. That is the that is the essentialist's approach to exercise. Now, you could argue that you could take out that interval session and either add another strength training workout in or just get rid of the interval session and keep it to the strength training workout. But that is my general recommendation right there. One intelligent interval workout and one very high level of intensity strength training workout. And the only thing that I would maybe differ from maybe some of the contributors to the podcast and maybe even a teeny bit from what James said is is doing a few more exercises. So if, if we, we would recommend if you're going to train once per week, getting closer to 10, 11, or 12 exercises just so that someone can be a little bit more comprehensive and do an exercise for the lower back, specifically do an exercise for the calf or the anterior tibialis, do an exercise for the neck extensors, just be a, a little bit more comprehensive. Can you both uh, start start starting with you, James? Um, what are you, what does your current workout look like? Um, my current workout is so I did a workout this morning, and I'll talk you through it. So I am um, three weeks past a, a tear in my right calf, um, which I did running, um, and I am um, somewhere between training and not training for a half marathon in about three weeks um so my workout this morning looked like uh, a very very easy 5k just to see uh, how my calf felt covering any kind of distance anything over you know uh, a mile um and see if i can sustain a pace that would would even be worthwhile running a half marathon um in three weeks um and then i went to a resistance workout straight from that so i did a uh, 45 degree leg press um I went to uh, and I did calf press on the same machine. They have a seated calf press, but on this occasion, I favoured using the leg press because it's plate loaded. I already loaded it up. Um, I went straight to a chest press where I did a uh, a very heavy first set, which consisted of uh, three repetitions. And on the third rep, knowing I probably wasn't going to get a fourth, I did a uh, probably about forty second eccentric. I really tried to. Um, uh, exaggerate that as much as I could and then I did a breakdown set and and this sounds like I'm contradicting everything I've said in the rest of the podcast <laughs> about breakdown sets and, and negatives um, from the chest press I went to a seated row so it's a completely opposite movement a seated press to a seated pull um, I'm getting over or I've got a bit of a, a bicep probably bicep tendonitis in my uh, distal uh, tendon uh, so I'm that? not doing it. Uh, I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, but but I'm um, I'm off bilateral um, compound pulling movements. So I did a, I did a unilateral seated row, um, and I probably looked like uh, the weird guy in the gym who looked like he just didn't train the other side of his body. Um, but what I, but what I did, believe it or not, is while I'm doing a left arm seated row, I am flaring my right latch to try and get an isometric <laughs> contraction. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm the guy that doesn't care what everybody else thinks in the gym. Um, So from there, I went to um, uh, an overhead press. 
and then I went to a single arm pull up. Uh, it was actually an assisted pull up, but I, but I realised a pull up sounded better. Um, so uh, yeah, single arm, left arm, assisted pull up. Um, and then when I reached failure on that, I did a, I did a couple of negatives. Um, I then went to a pec fly and a rear delt fly. And then I went back to lower body and did uh, knee extension, um, prone leg curl, uh, hip abduction and hip adduction. Um, And a lot of that varies because uh, I was training at a large commercial facility on this occasion. And the other facility that I normally train at is a university where we don't have as many as, as much variation in resistance machines. So... Um, when I train at the the large commercial facility, I, I tend to throw in things like hip abductor, adductor, um, pec fly, rear delt fly because because they have the machines there to use. When I train at my university, we have a, a, a Star Trek or Nautilus leverage um, chest press, which is fantastic. Um, we have uh, a range of Nautilus nitro uh, leg press. Uh, pull down and overhead press, um, medex, uh, knee extension uh, and lumbar extension, um, and my workout probably revolves around those. Um, more often than not, with uh, some kind of deadlift, whether it's a barbell or a dumbbell deadlift, um, dumbbell because I just don't want to waste the time loading and unloading a barbell. Um, and I, when I train there, I often do uh, either hanging leg raises or um, like a side bend um, with a dumbbell or with a plate. So those are, my, those are my kind of two pretty standard workouts right now. Um, I normally do one of those per week uh, or at least with probably 48 hours rest between workouts. So. Okay, cool. And Luke, what about you at the moment? What does your workout look like? Well, the workout I did on Monday night was uh, it was body weight chin ups to failure, body weight dips to failure. That's a two four cadence right into medics leg press at a two four cadence. Um, that was eleven reps at failure, and then I reduced the range of motion and, and did six more repetitions. Then a little bit of rest. Then a set of negative only chin ups with a lot of weight hanging on my waist, and then a set of negative only dips. And then it was medics uh, abdominal for 12 repetitions as a goal, medics uh, low back or medics lumbar extension uh, for 8 to 12 reps. And then we have a neck machine that's made by Rogers or Pendulum. Um, it's a plate-loaded machine, so I did one set of neck extension, so the, the back of the neck, and that was the workout. That was a short workout for me. That's a total of five, six, seven, I think eight sets. So that was a, on the short side for me, I'm usually closer to 10 or 12. So that was that workout. And then as you know, Lawrence, I'm always, um, kind of in the, in the process of training for something in terms of a marathon or a half marathon or some race. So in addition to the one or two workouts per week or really one workout every five days, I'm running three times per week, and then I use a Stairmaster step mill for 30 minutes twice per week. So those three runs, um, one of them is a 30-minute, very high level of intensity interval workout. One of them is a seven-mile run. It's just at like a 7.15 pace, 7.15 pace. And then uh, one right now, it's just about a 10 to 13-mile run on a Saturday morning. And that will obviously increase as I get closer to a given marathon. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. My strength training workouts vary between our different locations. And we have slightly different equipment. And I have different workouts that I'm recording between those different locations. For example, this Saturday, we do a, each quarter we do a, a new employee welcome reception little get together for any of the new employees we hired in that last quarter and we do it at someone's house so we're going to be actually at one of our employees homes and, and James knows this employee and he's been to his house his name is Rick and at his house he has more strength training equipment in his house than most commercial gyms do I mean he has original <laughs> Nautilus machines from 1972 he has hammer strength machines Nautilus machines of all different eras so Nautilus like first generation um, Nautilus 2ST Nautilus Power Plus Nautilus Nitro uh, like I said hammer strength Nautilus leverage equipment and then he has just an array of collective 
collectibles uh, on the walls. So it's really an impressive training environment. And this is all in his home between his garage and his, his kind of downstairs. So I'll have our whole staff over there and we'll do a workout together. Well, that's that's equipment that I normally don't use. So we'll write a workout and um, I'll get over there early and he and I will go through a workout first and then our whole staff will come over and we'll all kind of train each other through um, some variation of that workout. So I work out at his house every now and then and then I bounce between our different facilities and then when I travel I try to find a way to train with some colleagues somewhere around the country and try equipment and try things that I, that I haven't tried previously. But Lawrence, one thing I really do want to mention is I want to mention because I've seen James Fisher train I think probably seven or eight times now over the last five years. It's really worth stating that James trains as hard and as focused as anybody I've seen train. Well, that's because he's trying to impress you, isn't he? That there, there could be truth to that. No, I, I think that's worth stating that there's so many guys that I've put on pedestals over the years, and then I see them train, and maybe they don't train that hard, and maybe – the rep quality and the other details of the workout um, that these people have written about and talked about and spoken about um, over the last two decades, maybe watching them work out didn't live up to my expectation. Well, I'm telling you, James Fisher trains so incredibly hard, focused, great form, great technique. And for me, I always respect an academic. I respect the pundit or the guru that actually absolutely practices what they preach and james definitely does do that and so i I think it's it's worth your audience hearing that that i've been around a lot of people in in our kind of area of high intensity training that when the rubber meets the road i think they can actually train uh, harder train more consistently pay attention to some of those details have a little bit more passion for their own workouts um James, I, I'm, I'm putting words maybe in his mouth, but James loves to train. He loves to work out. And one of the saddest things that happens in our industry, in our field, is we spend so much time. And Lawrence, I know you're not living this specifically because you're in a different work environment, but sometimes you spend your whole life training other people and interacting with clients that your own passion or your own fervor for your own workout starts to diminish. And I, I'm telling you, my personal training and strength coach brethren out there, they've lived this, that, that maybe they they put their workouts on the back burner. And I have so much respect for James Fisher because he's really made his workouts and his training and all the, the, the approach to the training, he's made it a priority. And I have so much respect for that. And I would just encourage you know my friends and colleagues and your listenership to find a way to get back to that point where you have that passion and you make it a priority. And whether you think your, your ideal frequency is twice a week or once every 10 days or somewhere in between, you gotta, you got to rekindle the passion for for your own workouts and i always respect james because when we work out together there are always great workouts and and he practices what he preaches james starting with you um i know i appreciate that your objective might not be this but um you know most people who are obviously uh practicing strength training or high intensity training are looking to maximize muscle gain do you still find even at this point that you are gaining strength and or muscle or do you think you've reached a sort of genetic ceiling for yourself and then the same for luke after after you've um, answered that you know this is i'm gonna i'm gonna give you the long answer to this and, and i think it might be interesting for people to hear um so I'm going to try and make it as quick as I can, though. So, um, so I did a half Ironman triathlon back in September, and I I deliberately e- entered and planned with like a six week plan before before doing a half Ironman, um, and I only did that because I do a lot of cycling anyway. So from a from a cardiovascular fitness perspective, I felt that I was probably pretty pretty capable of doing it um, anyway. Um, I've previously been a very good swimmer. Um, so I knew that, um, you know, a bit of time to get back in the, in the pool or in the lake, um, would, would kind of see me back up to that, up to, you know, meeting the cutoffs for the swim time. And I knew the run was going to be brutal for me because it was a trail run. Um, and my body just doesn't like that kind of pounding anyway. Um, you know, my knees and, and, and a lifetime with basketball just to, as, as you know, um, running's really not my thing. Um, 
and I found that um, I mean, talking about workouts, I went to a split routine because I really didn't want to lose my strength sessions around that workout, uh, around my other training. So trying to fit in swimming, cycling and running. And I ran once a week. I probably did maybe five or six runs in the whole build up to that half Ironman. And um, a couple of them were treadmill and a few of them were out on the trail just to kind of plan the route or kind of get a visual of the route and uh, and experience the terrain and things like that and just how much uh, incline and decline was on the run um but what i found is i went to a split routine so i trained my legs in the middle of the week so that my legs were fresh for a run or a cycle at the weekend um or a swim uh, and i and i tended to find that i would do a swim on a saturday morning and then and then a bike or a run after that um if not both uh, and i would still fit in resistance training sessions on maybe a monday a lower body wednesday and then upper body again maybe thursday or friday um and immediately and, and in getting to answering your question as soon as that was done like, you know i found i lost um i probably dropped um maybe f- five kilos so the equivalent to 10 pounds uh 12 pounds maybe um in, in kind of in that whole process um and i and i did that quite deliberately um because my body uh my weight you know wasn't gonna the, the less I, I tend to think the less weight i carry when i'm running the better so the better it is for my knees and for the impact um but as soon as i was done with that half ironman boy i set into eating and i set into training like you know like i just uncovered something new um and i put on probably the um I put those five kilos back on pretty quick. I mean, probably within four or five weeks. Um, and I was still at the same body comp that I'd got down to um, for the for the half iron, which was sub 10%. And, um, and my strength was just absolutely through the roof. My, um, you know, uh, now and then I like to go to a dumbbell shoulder press. And it's not an exercise I particularly advocate because I think it's actually reasonably high risk if, if you're unstable, you know, your potential to externally rotate and completely tear your shoulder apart is pretty high. But now and then I like to just pick up heavy dumbbells. And um, I went up to a, you know, a 35 kilo dumbbell shoulder press, which I appreciate for many listeners will, will scoff at that. But for me, that's pretty good. Um, and that was for a good eight or 10 repetitions. So I was pretty content with with the, I, I was putting muscle or certainly strength back on very quickly um, or, or increasing in strength very quickly after that. Um, day to day, um, I, I think I'm probably pretty close to my genetic potential. I don't think there's a huge amount I could do uh, to, to really see big differences. Uh, in, in the year, my body comp will fluctuate between probably – eight or ten percent up to maybe fifteen percent um depending on how much i'm enjoying food and how much how much i'm exercising and how much i'm cycling um so my wife uh, is a is just a phenomenal athlete um so i spend half my time on a bike trying to keep up with her um although right now she's actually uh 22 weeks pregnant so i can beat her on a bike for the first time in our entire time together um (laughs) and uh, and um, when I'm doing a lot more cycling, I tend to drop a bit of a drop a bit of fat, and that's fine. And when I get back to uh, get off the bike, or winter comes around, I eat a bit more and I lift a bit more frequently, or a bit more comfortably, and I put a bit back on. Um, but that just fits within my life. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be obsessed with my protein intake. I'm not a bodybuilder that's going to set my alarm for three or 4 AM to wake up and have a protein shake and, and take, you know, my, uh, uh, amino acids or whatever else they take. Um, um, you know, I just, I, I, I let it fit within my lifestyle. I like food uh, and I, and I like to train and I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy with things, but I don't think that I'm a million miles from my genetic potential for, for with regards to strength and size so and i forgot to say congratulations by the way um thank, <laughs> thank you very much <laughs> um so so luke what in t- again so obviously you, your objectives are slightly different um yet similar in that you you know you're training for marathons um so is it would it be fair to say that you're not necessarily um pursuing 
maximum muscle mass um you're, you're kind of content with your weight you're just trying to improve your performance um or is that not the case lawrence i'm going to tell you a story that's going to give you the answer to that question this is my all-time favorite james fisher and james Steele story so this is my first time ever in the uk this is about a year and a half ago so it's august of 2015 and we're sitting at a, a what a train station and we're waiting for the train and james james and i are talking and james fisher it was either James, either you asked me this or James Steele asked me, and you said, theoretically, if you could develop an incredible amount of muscularity, I mean, if you could have Casey Vitor or Arnold Schwarzenegger's arms, w- would you have them? If you could stimulate that type of hypertrophy, would you want it? And I looked at both of them and I said, yeah, of course. And, they, and it got silent for three seconds and James Fisher looked at me and said, yeah, that's that's the right answer. So, it, and he was being funny, but it was like I was being tested. And of course, the answer was I want as much my muscle hypertrophy as possible. Um, so, I think I came out of the womb wanting to maximize muscle hypertrophy. So, my goal is always to finish a marathon as fast as possible while carrying with me the largest biceps and triceps that I can carry with me, um, which is not very large. But I will tell you this. So, so I absolutely want to maximize my strength and hypertrophy uh, gains. Uh, James uh, Fisher will not be impressed by this, but I was with Jim Flanagan a week and a half ago, and he put me through a workout. And his direct quote was, it looks like you've added significant size to your biceps and triceps since the last time I saw you, which was um, October. So I don't know if he was right or if he was just being nice, but I'll take it. Um, I, I want to live life in crescendo, and I want to have a focus that I can continue to chip away at adding a little bit more lean tissue. And, and uh, I'm always measuring, and I know it's not the best measure, but it's the measure that we have in the bod pod to make sure that I'm always increasing our lean, my lean tissue and trying to minimize fat tissue overall. So am I going to morph into to, uh, Sergio Oliva? over the next three years no but i'm going to fight every workout and try to optimize the muscle growth because uh you know that's what i'm passionate about and so it may be very small gains over time but i'm convinced that i can continue to add some some lean tissue still can i can i add to this because i think first of all jim flanagan would say that what we did with you is a litmus test I just, I just want to say that, Luke, and you, <laughs> and you, and you did pass. So well done. Do you remember um, that? Do you remember when you asked that? Uh, yeah, I do. I can remember. We were at Kew Gardens train station. Yep. Okay. Um, so, um, one of my goals over the past few years, and and maybe this is since I met my wife, because uh, when I met her, she she was a GB triathlete. She's since been a GB cyclist, and she's like I said, she's a tremendous athlete. Um, but but I I think that you know I don't I don't play basketball anymore, and I miss that to some extent. And I like to have different challenges. So the half Ironman last year for me was you know I did the, I did a half Ironman in, in like five hours fifty, and to, so some people will be awed by that, and it's really not that amazing, um, and some people will scoff at that time. Um, but but actually, it was about having a personal challenge for me, and I'm the same as Luke. I want to be able to do that with the biggest biceps and triceps I can, um, you know, looking as lean and as muscular as I can ar- around the way. Um, but I, I, I love the idea of doing different challenges. So a few years back, I did Tough Mudder, and I've dabbled in triathlon, culminating in the half Ironman last year. I'm doing a half marathon this year. And, and the idea was a view to seeing how that went and maybe even doing a marathon later in the year. And I think it's nice to have those different challenges along the way. Um, yeah, I want to ha- have a, as much muscle as I can. And I want to be as strong as I can. But I, I'm you know a realist over over things like that. Um, I also know that I carry weight quite well. So when I said before, I fluctuate between like eight and 15% body fat. I know that there are guys, you know, when you talk to Clarence Bass, he'll probably tell you his body fat never goes over 10%. And Roger Schwab would probably say the same thing. When I'm 
fifteen percent body fat, I probably look like I'm closer to ten or twelve. Uh, Luke might disagree. No, um, I a hundred percent agree with that. I hate you uh, for that. <laughs> yeah. I, st- I still, you know, even when I'm, I- I've been down, when I was at university, I was down at 4% body fat, and I never had the vascularity that, that so many people did. So I, that, that's just one part of my uh, anatomy that doesn't, that doesn't stand out. I, I just don't have veins sticking out in my forearms um, or, or my upper arms. I have veins that stick out in my left shoulder when I do a workout, bizarrely. Um, but, but. I always carry, even when I'm carrying a bit of fat, I still have reasonably visible obliques and abdominals and good definition through my quads and, and my calves and things like that. So, and, and my hamstrings. So places that it's not easy to get definition when you're carrying a large amount of fat. Um, so I'm far more content to be, um, you know, 85 to 90 kilos um, and carrying 15% body fat because I, I feel comfortable with it. I'm a bigger guy with it, uh, and I still have, you know, definition that I can have. And I feel when I'm carrying more weight, I'm I'm stronger. When I focus on being leaner, I know that there's a a nutritional focus in that. There's an energetic focus in that because I'm doing either cardiovascular exercise, traditional cardiovascular exercise like cycling or running or swimming, and maybe that just detracts my energy from from resistance training. So. So I think that people really should find they should they should not stop striving for what they want to achieve, but they should also take a realistic approach. But they should focus on enjoying life and doing something that challenges them. Um, you know, maybe they want to set a, P- a PB on a deadlift, and that's what they focus on for a while. And then after that, they want to set a PB on a bench press or a leg press or something like that, and they should focus on that. I, I think as soon as you get to physical attributes from an aesthetic perspective where we're all probably uh you know hardcore guys well probably destined to be a little bit disappointed because like luke said you know there's there's none of us on this on this call gonna end up looking like casey or arnold or sergio or boyaco or 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 mensa or anybody else so that's very true um <clears throat> so i just wanted to kind of uh, i guess shift gears into um, i'm interested to hear both your thoughts on uh, an aspect of nutrition so i've been following this guy on twitter recently called sean baker he's a quite entertaining guy to follow his tweets are quite uh controversial um he's an older bloke i think he's in his i think he's just turned 50 uh, very fit um he's an orthopedic surgeon um and very very uh, interested in fitness and nutrition in general so he him and a couple others another guy called ted Naiman, have been um testing zero carb diets so eating basically you know big plates of animal protein um sort of once or twice a day i suppose with with some intermittent fasting thrown in um and i believe the the, the idea behind the diet is predicated on the view that vegetables mo- many vegetables aren't that easily digested and or contain some negative properties and that animal protein gives you all you need i'd just love to know your thoughts on such a diet starting with you luke oh no you have to start with james you can't start with me on this one okay i'll start with, <laughs> start with james then Okay, uh, I'm interested to know why Luke deferred that. I think he's on Google looking up who these guys are. Or <laughs> that is not the case. <laughs> um, um, do you know what? This is quite interesting. I read Gary Taub's uh, um, book a, a few years back, and I know earlier on in that he cites anecdotally guys went on purely meat-based diets uh, for for like a year or so. I think, if I recall correctly. Um, I know that, you know, from a nutritional perspective, what we consider fruit and vegetables now are a far cry from what they once were because of the, um, the, the you know, the, the nutrients and vitamins and mineral properties that w- was previously contained in soil um, and therefore in the, in the vegetables that we ate. So, so, you know, they're probably far, far more deficient than they used to be. Um, the idea of going on a zero carbohydrate diet to me, you know, if if I have a personal chef, then yeah, sure, that's that's potentially reasonable. But to you know, things like that are just they're just inconvenient for life in general. Um, I I love the taste of fruit and veg. I mean, I I, I think from this perspective, I'm blessed. Um, 
I don't really have a sweet tooth. So, I, you know, if you said to me, do you want, um, you know, a larger main course, but no dessert, no uh, sweet um, after the main course, would you take it? I would take, yeah, for sure. I'd take two steaks and, you know, you can ditch the um, carrot cake, which I know is Luke's favorite. So, um, I, I, but, you know, so for me, it's it's pretty easy. I love fruit. I love vegetables. I love meat. Um and, and there we go. So I, I, I would never consider anything like a zero carb diet. I've done low carb diets um, where I've cut out processed carbohydrates. Um, I would, I, if you said to me, you can't eat broccoli, I, I would probably struggle. If you said you can't have an apple or a banana, I would probably struggle quite, quite considerably. Um, and I, and I, you know, I know that there are arguments around this. Like I said, in, in, Ta- in Taub's book, um, you know, there was talk that carbohydrates prevent our, um, our ability to absorb certain micronutrients. Um, but I, I'm not convinced that, that that's appropriate. The closer, the more I read around nutrition, the more I think the best advice I ever got was probably from my mother. And she said, everything in moderation. Oh, I hate so. that statement. Uh, I, you know I, I hated it for a long, long time, and uh, and to be honest, the the more I uh, the the longer I live, the more I come back to that and go, you know what? There's there's a degree of logic in it, and there's a degree of convenience in it as well. But doesn't so, it just ha- doesn't it just mean that people can justify having a Mars bar every day? Like, do you know what? Do you know what, do you know what Lawrence? For, from a um, from a philosophical perspective, shouldn't we do what we enjoy doing? And if you want to have a Mars bar, shouldn't you just have a Mars bar? You know, I, I if I want a Mars bar, I'm going to go and get a Mars bar. I, I'm not going to care about saying, well, it's processed sugar or anything like that. I'm going to say, well, you know, I I train hard, um, I work hard at my job, I enjoy life. I'm just going to have a Mars bar if I want to. If I want to do that, I'm going to do it. So. You know, there are times when I get more strict. If I'm training for an event, when I was training for the half Iron Man, I wouldn't have done that. Um, if I commit to this half marathon in like three weeks, then I probably will will stop uh, with with certain food types. Um, but like I said, I don't I don't have a craving for a Mars bar. Like I'm more likely to have a craving for an apple or a banana. So maybe it's just easier for me to do. So, but yeah, I completely agree. I hate the phrase "everything in moderation." but I can see the logic and the convenience for it. So, um, I guess looking at zero carb from mostly uh, an efficacy point of view, Luke, what's your, what's your view on that kind of diet and, you know, it being, it being efficacious for, um, for health and I guess maximizing your, your results from your workouts and that type of thing. Yeah. Lawrence, that's an interesting question. I'm going to give you an answer that you're not, maybe expecting but i really have no opinion and i've tried to make a practice of talking very little about nutrition in general Mm. despite the fact that i may actually share opinions or have opinions personally but i I just haven't made a consistent commitment to reading the literature and nutrition and so i could opine and i i listen to your podcast and i listen to a couple other nutrition podcasts and i i read a book from every now and every now and then and i look at some of the research around nutrition as it relates to promoting strength and hypertrophy but i just couldn't get into the long debates that some of your other listeners and guests can get into so i will tell you that i consume carbohydrates and a normal meal for me is either a piece of chicken or um, a piece of fish for dinner every night with like a red potato and some asparagus or broccoli and that is like four or five nights out of the week that's what the meal is and um, beyond that I don't have anything uh, to offer, and the reason I'm I'm really drawing a line in the sand there is, I just don't want to get I don't want to get into a controversial area that I feel like I don't have tremendous expertise on. I will tell you that we counsel our clients only around maximizing their overall protein intake, targeting one gram of protein for every pound of body weight. Okay, and not really exceeding that because there's probably no value in that. And combining that with monitoring their overall 
caloric intake and eating the foods that they like, but eating just a little bit less of them. And I will tell you, and I don't know if I can I can prove this because I don't know what other facilities have done, but I think that we've demonstrated better body composition change or body composition change in our clients over 10 years that can rival body composition change in, in anyone that's engaged in exercise anywhere. Uh, remarkable body composition change, focusing on just that. Intelligent resistance training, maximizing overall protein intake, and then reducing overall caloric intake. I think that's a that's a very mature response, and I think there's nothing wrong in saying that you don't feel as informed on the subject to have an opinion, um, and that your opinion is always changing. I I, I totally um, accept that, and I think that's a mature position to come from. Um, Lawrence, I I have a question for Luke on that, if yeah, that's okay. Go for it. Luke, you counsel people on one gram of protein per pound of of body weight? We say that's the upper limit. So you would want to start at aiming for like 0.8 up to one one gram, but there's no logic in going over one gram. Why, why do you use a metric and an imperial measurement in that? <laughs> A metric? Oh, because I want to pay respect <laughs> to both, uh, what, Mother England, but also <laughs> um, honor how the rest of the world measures things. <laughs> okay, because honestly, the, the real answer, James, is everyone's food, when you purchase food, everything is in grams. Everything's in grams. And we don't talk about kilos when it comes to people's body weights in the U.S. Mm-hmm. So so that's that's the approach. I thought we were the only country confused about using metric and imperial, but it turns out America... Oh, absolutely. And when we were in elementary school, we were told by all of our teachers that by the time you're an adult, you will only use metric because, you know, the imperial will be extinct, and that, that is not the case. Okay. James, you realize all of my American listeners now hate you. So. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, they probably hated me before anyway, so... <laughs> um okay guys i'm conscious of time so i've got a couple more questions if that's okay yeah Um, i just have probably a couple minutes because i gotta jump into a meeting respectfully lawrence no worries i i I will wrap up then um luke you wanted to mention uh, a book recommendation um that you thought the listeners would love do you remember what that is yeah, so two books. One of them, I think, is just going to absolutely resonate with your audience. Is a book I actually mentioned earlier, Essentialism by Greg McEwen. Uh, just a phenomenal book, a very quick read, and if you want to do the audio version, the author reads it, and I appreciate his British accent, and I love it when an author actually reads his own audio book because they understand the contents a little bit better. But what a great framework for looking at your training, but also our professional lives, our business lives, our family lives. Essentialism is just a profound, important read, and a simple read, but an important read. And the other book that I'm really into just came out recently. is It's Ryan Holiday as the author, and the book is called Ego is the Enemy. And if you're a fan of philosophy, but you're also a type A, motivated, driven, a professional individual, this book is a marriage of, of understanding the modern organization and uh, some of the philosophical roots of how a type A driven individual um, survives and thrives. It is just an absolutely phenomenal read, and that's called Ego is the Enemy. I've uh, heard of both books, and I want to read both very badly. They, they, they sound, they're sound right awesome. up your alley. You will absolutely love them. Mm-hmm. Um, James, have you got any any books that you've read recently that have sort of blown you away that you want to recommend and that come to mind on the subject of uh, productivity or exercise and health? Honestly, no, not at all. <laughs> um, I, I can tell you the last book that I read that really blew me away, but it's not related, not directly related to productivity or health. Um, it, it's um, it's a book called uh, Race Like Hell, and it's about how uh, Ford set out to win the uh, Le Mans 24-hour race in France um, because they uh, they were looking at buying Ferrari, 
um, as a company, and then Ferrari pulled out, and it cost Ford a lot of money. And uh, Ford, Henry Ford the the second, or the Deuce as he's called, um, just ploughed money into trying to take uh, uh, motor racing victories away from Ferrari, and they developed the Ford GT40. Uh, and uh, and uh, aside from exercise and and life and everything else one of my big passions is like motorsports and cars and, and specifically american muscle cars and this book was absolutely fascinating actually so if anybody's interested in cars <laughs> then th- this is a book to look at <laughs> awesome completely off topic but but good absolutely to, good to end on that um okay. so for everyone listening for to find the show notes for this episode and for all episodes go to 15 minutes corporate forward slash podcast that's 1515 the number um if you like this episode please subscribe as that helps me massively uh send it to a friend to listen and then take a brief moment to leave a review on itunes all those things really help to promote the podcast and uh help me get better guests on in the future um you know guys are better than than james and and luke Uh, to keep (laughs) keep, (laughs) to keep up to date on all of the corporate warrior news uh, you can follow me on twitter lawrence m that's m for mike neil spell n-e-a-l lawrence m neil and also check out corporate warrior on facebook and as always thank you very much for listening